Once again, we're back with our uh, classroom joining in along with people around the world as we study about spiritual gifts. This is session 12, and in this session, we will be studying 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14. And you may wish to open your Bibles and join with us, and I encourage you to do so that you can follow along as we go through it. In the last session, I talked about five principles regarding this analogy Paul uses of the human body to the body of Christ. And I drew on the chalkboard these principles. And if we'd look at the chalkboard for just a second, unity is the overarching principle. Unity is the most important principle. Jesus wants the body of Christ to remain united not divided. However, a house divided against itself cannot stand, as he said. And any one of these other four principles can be a cause of cementing the body together or breaking the body apart. Diversity, interrelationship, equality, and uniqueness. And over the next few sessions, we'll be looking at unity as it is contained within one of these. So this session is diversity within unity. So as I open my Bible, we'll read in 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 12, where Paul begins to go into the study of how the human body relates to the body of Christ. And you will notice as we go through this that he echoes many of the same things that he talked about in Romans chapter 12 in the last session. However, he goes a little deeper in this one. He talks about it a little more and he brings out different principles. In the last session, it was primarily that we're, we have unity, that we are one body and we have many members. And the one body is the unity, the many members is the diversity. So let's look at verse 12. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. That's a similar thought to what he's had said before. So it is with Christ. In the human body, one unit, many parts, but they form one body. Just the way it is in the human body, so it is with Christ. In verse 13, he says, For we were all baptized by one Spirit, into one body, whether Greeks, Jews, or Greeks, slave, or free. And we were all given one spirit to drink. And what he's saying in this verse is, though we have diversity, we have unity because we have Christ. And we have the Holy Spirit. What holds us together? What makes us have a united body? It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. It's our belief. And it doesn't matter if you live in Asia or Africa or Latin America, North America, Europe, Australia. It doesn't matter if you're down at Antarctica. If you are a Christian, the thing that holds us together in common is Jesus Christ, our belief in him, our understanding of him, our experience with him. And then it doesn't matter what language we speak, what foods we eat, what customs we practice, even what churches we attend and their style of worship. The thing that connects us to one another is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk a little bit more about this diversity and how it uh, is within unity in just a moment. But let's finish up with verse 14. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So he begins with the body as a unit, made up of many parts, and he ends this section with now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Concluding thought. Now, when you read the Bible, remember that the Bible was not written in paragraphs. It was not written in sections. 
it was written as a letter. It was only later in future centuries that they decided, all right, we'll break things up into these verses. This occurred when the first printing press came about. Gutenberg developed the printing press. It was a wonderful invention. It transformed education and learning around the world. It was as important back then as the development of the computer is now and the use of the internet to acquire information. But because they were going to print the Bible and for the first time make it available to all of the people, they thought, boy, we better break it apart because how will somebody know you should go back and talk about the body of Christ? There's no way to find it. You have to look through all the letter till you find it. So they started making the different verses and they did it hurriedly. And then as they printed it, an editor of, this is the New International Version Life Application Bible. You probably have a different Bible. The editor said, okay, this section, this is about spiritual gifts. This is about one body, many. And then they made paragraphs. In my Bible, verse 14 is a whole new paragraph. I think it's part of the previous paragraph. And then he goes on to another thought. So when you look at the Bible, look at the fact that this is only how man viewed it. It may not be the way you view it as you study the Bible. So, Paul has laid the same foundation as he has before, and he has especially talked about it doesn't matter what nationality you are, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, all that matters is that you know Jesus, and that Jesus holds us together at one. I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is becoming smaller. What I mean isn't that it's shrinking. I mean, we have transportation. It took me eight hours to come from my country to the country of Russia. Do you have any idea how long it would have taken a hundred years ago? You would have had to get on a ship, you would have had to take an ocean voyage over to Europe, then you'd have to take a ship from England over to the mainland of Europe. You'd get on either a, a wagon or a coach with a horse or perhaps a railroad. And then you'd come to uh, Moscow and eventually end up in the location we're at. That would be a long journey, certainly more than eight hours. The world is becoming smaller. Most of us in this room most of the, you, you watching on DVD have a cell phone. You can pick up your cell phone and call anywhere in your country and anywhere in the world. Though I am far away from my children, I can text them. I can send them email. I can call them on the phone and talk to them right away. Do you have any idea how long it would take to get a letter from one place to another a hundred years ago? Probably the same length of time as the trip took from one place to another because you'd bring the letter with you. So the world is getting smaller. And because of that, the peoples of the world are having much greater interaction with each other. And because of all of these new technological advances, the Word of God is being spread far wider and far greater than it was in previous centuries. It was a missionary had to go to a country that didn't know Christ. Somebody had to translate the Bible. Somebody had to teach that to the people. Now they can go on the internet and read the Bible. They don't even need the, this Bible. They can go on and the Bible's on the internet. And they can hear the message of Jesus Christ by listening to a DVD or watching a DVD. It's easy for people to have an iPod 
and listen to iTunes. We have so much technology that it has made evangelism and discipleship um, much easier than it was in previous times. And as a result, Christianity is exploding in the world. Now, in my country, it's shrinking. In Europe, it's shrinking. These were the areas that were strongholds of Christianity in previous centuries. Now, the number of people who are Christians are going down and down and down. In other parts of the world, it is absolutely exploding. And as a result, there's far greater diversity. And this presents challenges in terms of our unity because most of us in Europe and most of us in America, we share similar cultures. We may have different languages, but most of us, you know, we believe the same things. My country is a country of immigrants. And where did most of those immigrants come from? They came from Europe. And it's only been in the past few years that we have had large influxes of people from Latin America. And of course, through slavery, we had many people come from Africa. So we are a nation of immigrants and we share a common bond with Europe through England. In Africa, in 1900, there were 10 million Christians. That's a pretty good number. And primarily, it was missionaries out on the field. By the year 2000, a little more technology available, 360 million. That's quite a jump from 10 million to 360 million. Technology has made that available. Transportation has made that available. The increasing contact we have with one another has both made it easier for people to hear the gospel, but it's also brought people together who live very differently and who may have long-standing resentments towards one another over the years due to war. And this threatens the unity of the body. It's a wonderful thing that the gospel is exploding, but it's also a challenge for those of us in this generation of the church to maintain the unity despite the diversity. In the year 2025, not too far in the distant future, it's estimated that there will be 633 million people who are Christians in Africa, and that's a conservative estimate. In other words, just between 2000 and 2025, it'll go up by 80%. Africa is an amazing story of how the gospel is spreading far and wide and people are coming to Jesus Christ. We don't hear about it. We just know what's happening in our country. But in Africa, it's amazing. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. There is an organization in my country that's called Campus Crusade for Christ. And they primarily work on college campuses, and they evangelize on those campuses, and they disciple. But they produced a movie called simply Jesus, and it was the story of his life. And then, much like uh, Trinity Video Seminary is doing, they presented it in English, but then they dubbed in the languages of the various people. And they brought that to Africa, where they see almost no movies. I mean, it's like, what is a movie? And they put up a big screen, and they used one of the old-style film projectors with the loop. And the people came from miles and miles around, and they sat down, and they watched this movie about Jesus. And then, of course, an invitation was given. Many people came to Christ. 
That's just one example of how the gospel is like spreading like wildfire on a prairie. It's just rapidly moving through Africa. Well, what about the other continents? What's happening in Latin America? Well, today there are 640 million Christians. And that represents 98% of the population. Think about this. Only 2% of the people in Latin America are not Christian. However, Christian includes the Catholic Church, many mainland Protestant churches. That does not mean just evangelicals. And I do not have a statistic for how many evangelicals are in that 98%. But I do know this. The largest growing church in Latin America is the charismatic church. That, like in Africa, is spreading like wildfire. And so many of the people who are Christians are now becoming more evangelical and going to charismatic churches. And that's a wonderful thing. By 2025, I can't imagine how many evangelicals will be in Latin America. So we see Africa growing rapidly, Latin America increasing incredibly. What about Asia? Well, Asia, as we know, is primarily Buddhist. And then in certain parts of it, rather than being Buddhist, they practice other religions, some of them pagan religions in India, Hindu religion. So there are many, many other religions. There are four billion people in Asia. There are only five billion people in the whole world. So four-fifths of the world's population lives in Asia. If there was any field for evangelism that's ripe for uh, spreading the gospel, it would be Asia. But right now, of those four billion, there's 460 million Christians. Now that sounds like a lot, but we're talking 4 billion and only 460 million Christians. But the good news is Christianity is growing in areas that we would least expect it to grow. Communist China is probably the area where Christianity is booming. It's just we don't have statistics because it's a closed society. And the communist government in that society doesn't want to release those figures because they are without God. Religion is not practiced in communist China. It's estimated that every single day, 365 days out of the year, except leap year, 28,000 new Christians come to Christ in China every single day. It's booming in China. And why? There is no place on earth where there is more persecution of Christians than China. And if you think about the book of Acts, wherever there's persecution, the church increases. It's an amazing thing that God has set up. Some Officials try to stamp out Christianity. Let's get rid of it. And so they arrest people. They put them in jail. They kill them. They behead them. They do all kinds of torture to them. And what happens? Instead of eliminating Christianity, it grows. This is God's design, that through suffering and hardship, we grow closer to God. When people are suffering, when people are in pain, when the worst things happen to them, what's the first thing they do? They pray. Even if they're not believers, they say, God, help me. Sometimes they'll say, if you will help me here, I will do this. So it's not like they're doing this as Christians. But isn't it interesting that their first instinct is to turn to God. It isn't in the good times that we grow closer to God. 
In fact, we tend to become colder in our faith when we go to God because I, it's good. I got most everything. I don't need you. Hey, God, just kind of hang back there, and when I need you, I'll call you. But when times are bad, as they are in China, people turn to God. And that's what's happening there. What about Europe? Any good news there? No. It's shrinking every year by 17%. And in England, only 7% of the people who call themselves Christians go to church. And that number is diminishing. The church is dead in Europe. There are pockets of Christianity in every society. There always will be what the Bible calls the remnant. There will always be the few who are faithful and who may practice in private out of fear. However, most of Europe, they are very secular. They don't practice religion. They don't go to church. And it's a very sad thing. When you think back to Martin Luther and the Reformation in Germany, when you think of the start of the churches from Scandinavia, when you think of the great revivals that took place in England, and now it's dead. Very sad. Very sad. Well, how about North America, where I'm from? Certainly there's lots of churches there. There's got to be tons of Christians, right? Not such good news from North America either. In North America, 76%, three quarters of the people claim to be Christians. According to George Barna, the researcher who is the preeminent researcher of Christianity, he says 8% of the population are evangelicals. That means of an overall population of approximately 350 million, 27 million are Christians of the evangelical uh, faith. And it's shrinking every year. And once again, the only group that's growing are the Charismatics. So somehow the Charismatic Church is reaching out and people are responding to it. Now for many of us, we may look at the Charismatic Church and have some differing views about it. But the bottom line is no matter how they worship, no matter what they believe, they still love Jesus. And they still preach the gospel and people are still coming to Christ. And so perhaps we should learn from them, what are they doing that's bringing so many people to Christ? What about missionary trends? Well, back in the 1800s, most of the missionaries came from Europe and England primarily. Then you go to the 1900s and the geographical center of Christianity switched to North America and most of them came from uh, the United States. How about today in the 2000s? Where do most missionaries, the most number of missionaries come from? The answer may surprise you. Korea. South Korea has more missionaries than any other country except the United States. And every year, South Korea gains on the United States. And very soon, South Korea will have the most number of missionaries in the world. That's an amazing statistic to me, one that I had not known previously. But it shows us how the world is changing. There is a geographical shift that's taking place. In previous centuries, the shift moved from England to North America. But as we look towards the future, the shift is moving to Southern Hemisphere, to Latin America and Africa. And in 2025, people who are white will represent only 20% of the church. 80% of the church will be of different colors it will be truly a multiracial church in the years ahead. And we also can look towards a future where the church will be more conservative because in Latin America and in Africa, 
they are far more conservative theologically and morally than those of us, especially in America. So the church will become more conservative. That could cause some conflict with those who are less conservative. And then finally, what will the typical Christian look like in 2025? This may surprise you. The typical Christian will be a woman who lives in Africa and worships in a tiny village somewhere in Africa. Or it will be a woman who lives in South America in a shanty town. The face of Christianity is changing. And those of us in Western civilization, we need to recognize that the church is not white that the church is not European or North America. The church is universal and it is changing. It is becoming much more diverse. And because of this, we face challenges in the years ahead to maintain the unity of Christ within this exploding diversity taking place in the world. Those of us in the West need to rethink who we are, who the church is, and we need to embrace diversity, not only within our own countries, where diversity is also exploding, but around the world. For Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say, go to Europe, go to North America. And oh, by the way, when you have some time, go down to Africa, see if they want to be Christians, and maybe those Asian people might be interested. He said, go into all the world. Well, guess what? Technology has made it possible for us to go into all the world in a way we've never been able to before. And just like you and I, people in Asia, people in Africa, people in Latin America, they hear the gospel, they understand it, and they accept Christ. And we should welcome them as our brothers and sisters even while we recognize that diversity will have its challenges in maintaining unity. Well, in the next session, we're going to take a look at the next principle, interdependence, and how that affects unity in the church. And we hope that you'll join us then.